Welcome to Northgate Bible Chapel Online. Thanks for checking out our podcast, where you can listen to our latest sermons, filled with teaching, encouragement, and hope from God's Word. So whether you're outdoors, in the car, or just poured some coffee, let's dive in to today's message. This morning, we're going to begin our study of the book of Ruth. It's going to be very interesting. It's also going to be challenging. We first need to meet the characters. Someone once said that you can't tell the players without a program. As we study Ruth, we're going to need to think about the characters that we meet. You know, what is their situation? And how do they deal with it? So, all of us, I think, have heard about epic journeys. I think Lord of the Rings uh, is an example of one, but I'm going to suggest that the book of Ruth is also an epic journey uh, of Ruth's moving from uh, going in and uh, getting married to uh, people from Israel, who we'll meet later, and uh, going through a very, very difficult time of famine. You know, again, these are epic journeys. A similar example might be Homer's The Odyssey. In that case, uh, It follows the Greek hero Odysseus, king of Ithaca, and his journey home after the uh, uh, Trojan War. Uh, So, as we go, we're going to uh, realize that we say you can't tell the players without a program. And so, we need to think about the characters that we meet along the way this week. And uh, how did, you know, supposed to go up, you know, so how do they process this? So, you've heard me use the term an epic journey. Uh, And that's something big. I always think of something like the Lord of the Rings uh, as uh, a a, uh, fictional journey. example of an epic journey. And again, you can look at Homer's The Odyssey. And that was one where, uh, it's a myth, it's where the Greek hero Odysseus, king of Ithaca, and his journey home after the Trojan War, which was very long, it took him 20 years to get home from the war. That is an epic journey. And the reason I bring this up is that Ruth's journey eclipses them all. So, as we start, uh, we need to look for clues in Ruth chapter 1. And you're going to do the same thing in the other chapters. But there's some things for you to to, uh, look for. Uh, first is repeated words or phrases, and you're going to find those, but you've got to watch. My favorite are surprises, when somebody, like uh, Ruth, does something that is unexpected. There will also be explanations of events given by the narrator. Somebody wrote the, the uh, uh, book of Ruth, uh, we don't know who did, uh, but they... Uh, gave us all the information that we need. And then, because we have such a loving God, uh, we want to watch uh, for the Lord taking action. Sometimes it happens at unexpected places. Another one is to watch for the mention of the word kindness, because kindness helped Ruth get through her journey. There's also, you'll also see later on, references to somebody called a kinsman redeemer. I want to think about what 
what that kinsman redeemer does and how it affects us today. Because indeed, uh, Ruth was pivotal uh, in the Old Testament. And then the other, uh, the last one I have here is to look for contrasts between the beginning of the story where we first meet uh, uh, the Israeli family that uh, started out on this uh, epic journey and then look at the end of the story. It's, it's quite a tale. Indeed, it is uh, a, a great story. So next I want to help you figure out where does Ruth fit into the history, especially the, uh, uh, the uh, timeline of the scriptures. And what we see is that uh, there was a time up uh, from the possession of the land that you see in the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, left-hand side to the, uh, the, the uh, period of the kings. You know, we start thinking of King David here. And in the interim, there was the period of judges. And so Ruth comes in right at the end of the period of judges and before the period of the kings. So now we know where she comes in. So someone once said, you can't tell the players without a program. You need to know who people are. And so I want to introduce you to the key people in this time of famine. It uh, really tested the faith and perseverance of all those who lived through it. So first we meet uh, in Israel, Elimelech, who was the father, Naomi, who was the mom, and they all lived happily in Bethlehem at the beginning. And they had two sons. One was Mahon, and the other was Chilion. And they were Epaphrathites. I always struggle over that one. Epaphrathites from uh, uh, Judah. It was a, uh, one of the sub-tribes. And the problem was they were facing a big famine in the area around Judah and beyond. I mean, think about it. We're, we're so used to going to Wegmans, and uh, we kind of grump when uh, our favorite uh, choice isn't there. But there's always another one. Uh, we're going to see it wasn't like that for, uh, for Ruth and her companions. You know, and they simply couldn't just go to Wegmans. You know, we take that for granted. And so here they were with no food, in their hometown, and so they decide to go look for better options. And they said, well, maybe it'll be better in Moab. Uh, spoiler alert, it wasn't. But uh, they went to look there. And I found something interesting. When you start thinking about Moab, uh, it was really a pretty mountainous, uh, desolate place. Israel was mountainous too, but uh, you know there was uh, enough water and the like. Moab was much more, uh, more uh, desolate, and so I, I thought it was kind of funny when a uh, shoe company had a boot for going into real, you know, uh, technical places that you wanted to climb, and they called it the Moab. You know, it, it's you know not a place that's going to be your first uh, your first uh, uh, destination vacation. So uh, we've met the we've met the family, and so we have to ask the key question: What happened in Moab? So again, uh, this is a uh, an epic journey, and so. They've decided, uh, uh, Elimelech and Naomi have decided, uh, there's no food here in Israel. We're going to go see if it's better in, uh, in Moab. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. Uh, and so along the way, their two sons, Mahalon and Chilion, married wives in Moab. And hint, Ruth was one of these wives. 
So uh, during this phase of the journey, um, you know, Elimelech, Mahon, and Chilion died. That left uh, Naomi, Ruth, and the other uh, servant that had gone with them, orphan, Orpha, destitute. So imagine, you, did, you, you thought you were going to go find better food. You didn't. Um, you, uh, you had uh, your, uh, your uh, father and uh, brother, uh, and they all died. Actually, both brothers all died. And so you have uh, Naomi, Ruth, and Orpha destitute. Now put yourself in, in their position. What would you be feeling about what's going on? Uh, what would you think about what the Lord was doing? Because you're going to see that's one of those themes because they're all calling out to the Lord. And so what we find at this point is that the women were terrified for a really good reason. So we realized that the women needed a plan. And so the women decide to return to Judah because they heard there was food there. Uh, but remember, they're still in Moab. And uh, Naomi realizes that she's old. Her two sons are dead. She has nothing to give her uh, two daughter-in-laws. And uh, uh, she uh, decides that she should be left behind. And she knew this was going to be certain death. And you can tell she was really depressed. You know, if you were old and couldn't uh, do what you used to be able to do in your youth, and you were facing some of that, I think, uh, I know I would be depressed with something like that. And it, at this point, uh, uh, these uh, uh, women from Moab didn't know about the Lord. And so they were really depressed. And so... Uh, uh, Orpha eventually decides to turn back. And they all uh, had a lot of, of, uh, of tears. It was a very hard decision. And so that brings us to verse 15. And after Orpha left, uh, Naomi gave Ruth another chance to leave her behind. And Ruth's response was that she would not leave Naomi, and it was firm. And th this is the key verse here in this uh, case. It really shows you Ruth's character. She says, where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Realizing they're back on, you know, going back to Israel. And she says, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. That is quite a, a declaration. And this was a woman from Moab. But she had seen what had been in Israel. And Consider how Naomi uh, responded to that. And we read, and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Basically, Ruth saved Naomi's life. So, in verse 19 we pick up the action where Naomi and Ruth are walking back to Bethlehem. Now, think about it. What do you think they were talking about on the way back? I'll give you a, a moment to think about that. And finally, they make it back to Bethlehem. And guess who shows up? Naomi's friends. And what I found interesting is that 
Naomi thought God had forsaken her. She, confused, she accuses God of testifying against her and bringing calamity upon her, and she had jumped to a conclusion. Now, I think a lot of us might have made that same mistake because she really did, Naomi really didn't, hadn't processed all of this properly. And in verse 22, we see that Ruth and Naomi got to Bethlehem in the time of barley harvest. Now guess what? That was a big deal. There was food back in Israel. They weren't going to starve. And that was great news. So, like most epic journals, we have a cliffhanger. And if you want to pick it up, you can come back next week when, uh, when chapter 2 is uh, covered. But what I thought interesting was when Naomi said, when the Lord, call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has uh, brought calamity upon me. And at some point she said, call me Mara, which meant that she had been uh, uh, not cared for. So I've got an assignment for you for this week. I want you to prepare for uh, Ruth chapter 2. And... I want you to look at and ask yourself, what would I, or how would I respond? And then now, we're going to say, we're going to ask, what is the Spirit of God teaching us? He didn't write this for no reason, and there's a message for each of us. Now, all of us have times of trial and you know, things just aren't going our way, and all we want is a word from the Lord. And he's given us one. He's given us the scriptures. And so, the last question I have on this list is, what is the Spirit of God teaching me? Because indeed, all of this here is for our edification, and there's a lesson that he wants us to learn. And Next week, when we gather again, I'd love to hear some of the thoughts that you've had after you've wrestled with this passage for a while. Uh, indeed, uh, it is a great cliffhanger here for, for the first week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for writing and preserving the book of Ruth. As we see her, we see her as a remarkable woman a remarkable woman who learned from flawed people who had been her masters. And yet she had a spirit that only God could have given her. And again, one of the cheats is that she becomes one in the line of the birth of David. It's amazing what God will do when someone who has not known him understand, understands through the word of God the benefits of, be, of believing. Father, we thank you for this wonderful chapter this week. We pray that we all meditate on it and learn from it and that it helps us in our day-to-day -day battle, uh, which is... Uh, much less than any of these uh, have faced. Father, you're a wonderful Savior, and we just uh, appreciate the opportunity here to, uh, to uh, start the book of Ruth. In Jesus' name, amen.